Hi, my name is Jay Quinn Minninger. Thank you all for coming today to my tech talk on neural networks, deep learning, and Google's TensorFlow API. Um, so there's a lot of complex stuff that we're going to go over, a lot of complicated content in the uh, future slides. So let's just ease into it with a uh, short little anecdote. When I was younger, I used to love playing soccer. And every weekend, I would go with my friends, and we'd go play for about an hour. And we'd always try out some new moves that we had learned that week on each other. And, and one week, all my friends had this cool new move down, and I could not get it. So I went home, very determined to get this move down. And I decided I'm going to spend an hour just doing this move over and over and over again until I get it. So I spent an hour, and over the course of that hour, I slowly started noticing little details and being able to implement those details until I got the full move down. So little, little, little tiny nuances, like exactly where you place your foot on the ball, exactly how you move your body, exactly the exact amount of force that you place into it. And through many, many iterations, I was eventually able to find these patterns, find these nuances, and put it all together and get the move down. Machine learning and big data is very much the same thing, very similar, OK? So uh, that's all machine learning is, is giving a computer a bunch of data, telling the computer, identify the pattern, find our pattern, and then extrapolate that pattern into an output. So let's just get the buzzwords out of the way. Maybe you guys know what these words mean. Maybe you don't. I, uh, they're thrown around a lot. Artificial intelligence is any algorithm that causes or allows a computer to act intelligently, or, or act like a human, rather. And then machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, which we just talked about, where you give the computer a bunch of pre-labeled pre data and tell the computer to find the pattern so that it can then use that pattern to predict new data that you receive later. And then Neural nets is another subset of machine learning. It's a particular type of algorithm that is based loosely off of our neurons and the way the brain works, uh, the way that neurons fire at a, when the uh, electricity uh, hits a certain threshold. So neural nets have become very popular over the past, I don't know, just five or 10 years. They've kind of exploded onto the scene uh, due to uh, recent, uh, uh, recent progress in the fields of processors, and we've all of a sudden also had much more data than we know what to do with. So Google has used them to implement self-driving cars to be able to tell the difference between a human, between, uh, I don't know, a leaf on the middle, in the middle of the road, another car, and it's getting this from a 2D image. So it's able to convert that 2D image, and it's able to get perception, essentially, from this 2D image. Uh, facial recognition uses this a lot. Siri, Alexa, Cortana, uh, they take your voice in as an input and are able to then kind of translate what you're saying into an action. So all of a sudden, these companies have uh, been able to use machine learning to their advantage, doing things and enable the computer to do things that we never thought before were uh, possible. So that's what machine learning is, but how does it work? We, get, we give the computer a bunch of data, which has labeled features, uh, which is also known as the input or the x variable, the independent variable, if you will. Uh, take, for example, a data set on housing prices. The features for this data set might be the size of the house, might be the neighborhood, a quantifiable measure of the neighborhood that it's in, uh, the proximity to the city, and oftentimes we'll pass numerous different features into the computer just for one data point. We'll have numerous different features or inputs for one data point. And then we also have the output, the dependent variable, the Y variable, the label we call it in machine learning, that gives you, would say, the price of the house. So we feed this to the computer, and it's able to give us, uh, fi find a pattern and predict a housing price based on a given set of information. So this is the most basic form of machine learning. It's just a linear regression algorithm. All we're doing is we're giving it a bunch of pre-labeled data, telling it, OK, I want an algorithm of the form y equals ax plus b. That's just a line. We have x, and we know what y is. Now give me the best x and the best b that will provide us with the least amount of error on this training set. So to a slightly more, com or very more complicated algorithm, neural networks, uh, it's a graph data structure where each node is a neuron, and each edge is considered a weight. Sorry. Uh, yeah, composed of neurons and weights. Uh, OK, so something very important. 
There are two types of supervised machine learning al algorithms, uh, classification and regression slash prediction. Neural networks really are only intended for classification, where you want to classify your input into one of many uh, discrete, uh, discrete number of values. So in this example, we have, I can't use my mouse, okay. We have two outputs, and those, uh, those will give you a number or a percentage likelihood that the input that you give it is to be that output. Uh, this is what a single neuron looks like inside. So as we mentioned, we have all the inputs here, and they are multiplied on each edge by a weight. So each input has its own weight that the computer, this is our parameter that our computer determines uh, over time through many iterations. Uh, you apply the dot product, which is just the product of each input and each weight, and then you sum all of those products to get one number. That number is then passed in to an activation function, which produces an output, which is either passed, which is either the output, total output, or it's get passed in as an input to another neuron. That's called deep learning when you have multiple layers of neurons. Uh, these are what the activations functions looks like. This is just an idea. So you have uh, your input, and it's getting passed into the activation function. We'll go over more of them on the next slide. Uh, the important thing is they're not binary, so it's not just one if greater, it's not just outputting one if it's greater than a certain, uh, if it's greater than say zero, and zero if it's less than zero. It's a, non, it's a continuous nonlinear function. That's really important as we'll see later. Again, these are the two most commonly used functions, uh, activation functions in neural networks. There's the sigmoid function and the rectified linear unit, which all of a sudden has been kind of uh, much more popularized over the past five years. As you can see, um, the threshold for both of them is more or less zero, especially for the rectified linear unit, the ReLU. It's zero. It's going to be a value greater than zero if the input is greater than zero, and if it, the input is not greater than zero, then it's just going to be zero. Again, it's important that they're nonlinear because when we take derivatives, we don't want derivatives of linear functions. Uh, so this is the learning part. This is the hard part. This is the slightly more complicated part. We're about to see a lot more math, and I don't want you to be intimidated because it's not that hard of a concept. It's just very intimidating. Uh, the gradient descent algorithm, that's what we call it. This is how the computer learns the weights, the parameters. The goal is to optimize the mean squared error. So every time we have an output, we run our data through this neural network, and it produces an output. And then we also, when we're testing, when we're training the data, we also have what that output was supposed to be. So all the error is, is we're taking the difference between the, what the output was supposed to be, and what the output, what the neural network gave us as an output, we're squaring that data, and then we're we're, we're summing it over the because it's multiple, multiple inputs. Um, yeah. So this is how we learn to optimize each of those individual weights parameters. Again, I don't. You're not supposed to understand this. The general idea is that we take the derivative of the error with respect to each of those weights, and whenever you take the derivative of something with respect to another thing. Uh, if you're trying to optimize the error, or minimize the error in this case, uh, we want the derivative of the error with respect to each of these weights to be as close to zero as possible, okay? Um, so this is the formula that we use. We go through it multiple thousands of times. This is what uh, we use every time we change the weight by this much. Uh, we have epsilon, which is just a learning rate. We'll get into that later. Normally, you want it to be a decaying learning rate. Uh, we have the input, x, i, and then the difference between the two, and we multiply them, and that's how much you change the weight by. And slowly, after thousands of iterations, your weights slowly um, become closer and are able to predict more accurately the data. Uh, so this is the more practical, th this is a, kind of the hello world of machine learning. Uh, these are 70,000 labeled images, handwritten, with handwritten digits between 0 and 9, they're passed into the computer as 28 by 28 pictures with 784 pixels. That's important because that means each data point is going to have, it's going to be represented by a vector of 784 different features. Okay, the accuracy, yeah, we'll skip that for now. Uh, this is TensorFlow, Google TensorFlow. So with those 15 or however many lines of code, that short little code blurb, we were able to get an algorithm that is able to predict with a 93% uh, correct accuracy rating uh, the value of the input of the data that you pass in, which 93 is not good in, in the machine learning community, but 
for this, for this little code, it's pretty awesome. Uh, so this is TensorFlow. We, we want to import TensorFlow as TF. It's similar, oh, I'm sorry, st uh, similar to JavaScript in that we, instead of, this is Python, by the way. We're importing instead of requiring. Again, we just want to set each variable. We tell it that it's going to be a matrix of 784 rows, and we don't know the amount of data points that we're passing in yet. We want W to be a variable that we're constantly changing over time. We're giving it a shape, the matrix a shape, where B is just another parameter that we're also tuning. Don't, don't worry about that. Um, I'm going to skip down to Y dash. That's just the label, what it's supposed to be. And then finally, we have Y, which is what we're generating based on the input. And all this is doing is we're saying, OK, we're going to run our input. This, the multiplication of our x matrix time our, times our parameter w matrix plus b. We're going to do that, and then we're going to run it through a softmax function, which is another, which is another activation function th that we use. Um, this is just the cross entropy is just another way of saying the error. It's another type of error function. We run it through that, and then we want to train it using gradient descent, uh, and we want to minimize the error or the cross entropy. Then we're able to run it. As you can see, there's just a simple for loop. We have 1,000 iterations. And with each iteration, we're just feeding our data, which is the MNIST uh, training values, uh, into the variables that we declared earlier. And then we're able to uh, predict it with that one line. And that's my presentation. We can opt. This gives us a 93% accuracy rating. But with things such as convolutional neural nets, which applies kind of a filter. I can't get into it now because of time. Uh, we're able to get up to 99%, 99.7% accuracy rating. Thank you.